God, that is our desire this morning that you would show us Christ, increase our love for the things that you love, the things that Christ died for, the things that we must be and do in this life so that you would be glorified, so that you would be magnified everywhere. Give us uh, greater burdens to see the gospel go forth, that we would be faithful to you wherever we go so that you receive all the glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the city of New Orleans, as late as the early 1700s, was still uncharted territory. It was uncultivated and untamed swampland, essentially. One historian said that of all the places in what would become the United States, there were few places more untamed or less, less likely to support a city than New Orleans. One engineer from the north said New Orleans was built in a place God never intended a city to be built, six feet below sea level, in the middle of a swamp, squeezed between a giant river, the Mississippi, and a huge lake. Lake Pontchartrain. French settlers called New Orleans Les Flottants, the floating island, and it was affectionately referenced by English settlers as the wet grave. Obviously, it was difficult to get French settlers, French citizens, to populate this new territory occupied by France, and so by, between 1717 and 1721, the French government increased the population of New Orleans from 400 to 8,000 through forced immigration. They essentially took the lowlifes of France, put them on boats, and made them sail to the new, the new city of New Orleans. One priest residing in New Orleans said of these immigrants, they are miserable wretches driven from France for real or supposed crimes. They considered the new country a place of exile and had no interest in progress of a colony of which they are only members in spite of themselves. Even the founder of New Orleans, Jean-Baptiste Jean Lemoyne, Sieur de Bienville, he told the French government, quote, all I have is a band of deserters, smugglers, and scoundrels, after which the French, government, uh, French regent, Philippe, he put an end to the, quote, deportation of criminals and undesirables to Louisiana. It's interesting to note that this same city that was initially populated with criminals has been up to this very day consistently in the top 10 most dangerous cities in the United States. That is depending on how you count the numbers though. Sometimes it's like 32 or something. So it, it can get better. Um, it's almost as if New Orleans though can't outlive uh, its origin. And so it's interesting to consider what hope is there for such a city as this, a city that according to some, should have never been settled in the first place and that has been populated to some degree or other by criminals ever since. What would it take to see a city like that truly changed? What would it take to witness even large-scale change by the power of the gospel and the grace of God in a city like New Orleans? Uh, the answers to these questions is surprisingly simple, maybe unsurprisingly simple, and Scripture gives them to us. And so I want you to see this this morning. Go to Acts chapter 17, and we'll actually have an answer to these questions. What would it take to see large-scale change, genuine change, 
revival in a hopeless city. Acts 17, the first nine verses is going to give us that answer. Luke writes, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them. And for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And he was saying, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. But When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. In Acts 17, Luke documents the revival that took place in the city of Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, God's spirit did what only God's spirit can do. Things like convince sinners of the truth of the gospel to produce new life in unregenerate sinners, cause them to submit to God's word and to join themselves to God's people. God's spirit accomplished this in this city. And the spirit of God did this to apparently large numbers, a large number of people in the same place in a very short time. Essentially, that is what we're talking about when we describe revival. God's spirit does what only God's spirit can do in a fantastic way across large numbers of people in a short amount of time. Now, we live like many believers before us did in a world where pragmatism reigns in the church. Um, Revivals across the history of of America have been attempted to be engineered. Men have seen the overwhelming effects of God's grace and God's spirit at work. And so they have sought to mimic what they saw working, uh, very much like the sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. And so they've sought to accomplish the same things that God has done on his own through the preaching and teaching and faithful handling of his word. They've men throughout history have sought to do those same things, but through some man-made program or some man-made system, those things get implemented in order to accomplish what only God can do by his own sovereign working. And so That's very much the same thing that's happening today. In order to see spiritual life accomplished, churches and their leaders employ gimmicks to get so-called seekers, quote unquote, into the front door. People come, they enjoy the show, everything from the music to the sermon, if it can even be called that sometimes. Everything's designed to manipulate the emotions. People come, they hear a 30-minute talk, The pastor tells some cute stories, makes some funny jokes, 
reads or references the Bible perhaps in order to challenge people with a moralistic message about being a little bit better than they currently are. That is all too prevalent in the church today in America. What ends up happening is people come, but they go home unchanged, but actually worse off than when they came because they think that they somehow are more in tune with God's plan for their life because of the whole church or religious experience. That is nothing but pragmatism, and it appeals to large numbers of people all the time. But that doesn't make it revival. That doesn't make it a genuine work of God's spirit. Revival cannot be engineered. Revival is not man-made. One church historian says this, revivals are not brought about by the fulfillment of conditions any more than the conversion of a single individual is secured by any means of human actions. The special seasons of mercy are determined in heaven. Though revivals are not man-made, we can't determine by putting a date on a calendar, by scheduling a conference or a series of sermons and calling it a revival. We cannot determine that revival takes place. And so although they're not man-made in this way, there are some things that are required for revival to take place. If God is going to cause large-scale conversions and submission to his word and grow his church in a unique way in a certain place, there are some prescribed means that he has determined that he loves to use to accomplish that kind of unique work. Uh, as I heard recently, as I heard it put recently, the Holy Spirit rides most comfortably in his own chariot. And so utilizing God's means are the most sure way to see God work. In Acts 17, this passage tells us under what conditions the Spirit worked best in Thessalonica. It essentially gives us four requirements for revival. These do not promise that revival take place, but these are requirements wherever we would see large-scale change. And so four requirements for revival is our outline for this sermon. The first of these requirements is faithful evangelists must go. Faithful evangelists must go. Verses 1 through 3 in Acts 17 detail this happening. When they, that is Paul and Silas, had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. How did Paul and Silas get all the way to this city of Thessalonica? Well, they came from first a well-established church, and they were specifically targeting or going to Christless places. They were coming from well-established church, uh, well-established church and going to a Christless place. Just flip back to Acts 13. You see the beginning specifically of Paul's journeys. We can often uh, wrongly think of Paul launching out as if he is rogue. Of course, he is an apostle, so he has Christ's own authority given to him to do what he's doing as an apostle. He's the one writing to the churches and commanding churches, instructing churches what to do under Christ's instruction. And so it's easy to think of Paul sort of above the church, but that would actually be wrong thinking. Even though he instructs the church, he is also a man submitted to the church in a unique way as a missionary. And Acts 13 shows us that. Look at verse 1. Now, there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, and it lists them, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, 
and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, that is Paul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So of all the teachers and prophets in this church, the Spirit specifically communicated in the only way that the Holy Spirit ever communicates, that is with words, this to the church, two men, Barnabas and Saul, to be set apart, specifically distinguished aside for everyone, from everyone else for a specific work. So this is what the church did in verse 3. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they did what? Sent them away. This is how Paul eventually gets to Thessalonica. He is commissioned by the Holy Spirit and the church for a specific task that he would go and labor in the ways that we see detailed throughout the book of Acts and Paul's ministry. And so from verse, uh, or from chapter 13, they launch out on the first missionary journey. Notice in verse four, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, verse three just said, they, that is the church, sent them away. Verse four says they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Did the church send them or did the Spirit send them? And the answer is yes. They went down to the places listed and began their ministry. They return to Antioch, report to the church all of their ministry, what they had been endeavoring to do and the fruit that God had produced through them. They spent a time at Antioch with that initial sending church again. And then in Acts 15, you can turn there. After this sharp disagreement now between the ministry partners, Paul and Barnabas, Paul launches out again, but not with Barnabas. Barnabas sailed away with Mark. But verse 40 in Acts 15 says, Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So this begins the second missionary journey of Paul. On that second missionary journey, they eventually land in Philippi in Acts 16. Due to persecution, uh, they eventually leave Philippi and then find themselves in Thessalonica. And so faithful evangelists must go. Paul and Silas and their companions were those faithful evangelists. They must go, which means they must be sent. The church sends missionaries. If you've been around Grace Bible Church for very long, this is not new to you, but it is worth repeating. The church sends missionaries. The church plants churches. Parachurch organizations do not do this. They are not qualified. They don't possess the authority given by God to do this. Individuals do not on their own authority determine when or how churches get planted. The church does this work. The spirit by the church does this. Missions boards do not, properly speaking, plant churches. And although some of those organizations, some people have usurped God's own authority through the church to plant churches, God also has been pleased in his mercy to use wrong ways to accomplish very good ends in establishing churches. But here in Acts 17, we are getting the ideal way to plant a church. Send out some number, two or more faithful evangelists to plant a church. They came from a well-established church, and they targeted a Christless place. 
Thessalonica being one of those cities. We must plant churches. We must preach Christ where he is not known. So notice, Paul did what was customary to him, according to verse 2. He went to, first, the Jews. That's why he found himself in the synagogue time after time. He would show up in the city. If they had a synagogue, Philippi didn't. Thessalonica does. So he goes to the Jews first. You'll remember his words even in Romans 1. He's unashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation, first for the Jew and also for the Greek. The Jews being God's people, they were the priority for Paul. They already had the scriptures. And so this was a wise, good starting point for a number of reasons. These faithful evangelists sent out by the church to a place that did not know Christ, through their faithful labors, saw a church birth in Thessalonica. Notice he showed up in the synagogue and go, or he shows up in the city in Thessalonica and, go, <clears throat> and goes to the synagogue, not to the brethren, not to the church. By the time, which would have been months later, in Thessalonians, when he writes the first letter, after he's left, months later, he wants to know how they're doing, so he sends Timothy back. Timothy brings a good report, and then Paul writes a letter back to the Thessalonians. In that letter, only months later, he can write this in chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. A church was born through his labors. For us, this might be old ground to be covered. It is old ground to highlight that faithful evangelists must go to a place that does not know Christ so that he, they make him known. Would it surprise you that this is not often how it happens? Oftentimes, far too often, the way missionaries get sent is people are discontent with the church or their church situation here. And so they go try and start their own work because they don't want to submit to anyone else. They, they can't find a church that's suitable to their preferences, and so they find themselves in a new place trying to start a church. Or someone who's not passionate about the gospel here, doesn't preach the gospel here, doesn't have a zeal to make Christ known here where they are. They're, they've never talked to their neighbors, their coworkers, their friends, their family about Christ but they're being sent off to go do that very thing somewhere on the other side of the world somewhere. That's not the way it ought to be done. People who are already zealous for God's glory to make God's glory known through an articulation of the gospel and unbelievers submission to Christ's Lordship. Those are the people that you want to send other places to spread the gospel, to plant a church. And this is what Paul and Silas were eager to do. Notice in verse 3 that from the scriptures, they explained and gave evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. They were saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. That was their message in a nutshell. Did they say more? Of course they did. This was the gist of the message that they brought to the Thessalonians. What that means for us, specifically as we um, target New Orleans, is that the people going must be faithful evangelists. People who are already eager for the gospel, eager to preach the gospel here must be the people who go. Go. 
people who are not eager to preach the gospel here can stay home. We must learn here what we must do there. It also implies just thinking about Antioch. Antioch actually historically became known for sound hermeneutical principles, how one studies and uh, interprets the scriptures. Antioch became uh, a leader among churches for that. They come up oftentimes during, uh, during church history. They were known for these things. This was a well-established church. Uh, just to, to think about the parallel here, these missionaries being sent out into a Christless place, uh, really, this implies that Grace Bible Church here in Tempe must be a well-established church. To send faithful evangelists cannot be a crippling endeavor for Grace Bible Church. All the evangelists can't leave here and go to New Orleans, in other words. The people who remain must be faithful evangelists still to raise up more faithful evangelists to go somewhere else. That still has to continue. That still has to happen. This must be a well-established church, even in the midst of church planting. The way we've uh, decided what we believe is wise is not to send out two men or even two people in their families to accomplish this. The way that we've uh, determined to do this is with a team of faithful evangelists, husbands, wives, children, uh, a, a widow, a couple single ladies, perhaps somewhere between eight and 10 households to go and do this work so that when we get to New Orleans, we are already on the same page as far as doctrine is concerned. We have the same idea in mind when we think about how are we going to reach New Orleans. And should God start saving someone, saving groups of people day one when we get to New Orleans, then we have something already being modeled between the core team for those people to come into so that when they step into these eight to 10 households, sound ecclesiology, biblical life as a church is already happening, being modeled for them. It's something worthy of imitation. That's how we want to do this. Um, people have asked, what's the timeline? And I've given like pretty much the same answer over and over and over again. It's always two years. Technically, it's about if, if things go according to plan, it's no longer than about 21 months before we can do this. Lord willing, it, it would even be sooner. But this is what we have in mind. Uh, recently, this same core team took a trip to New Orleans a couple weeks back. And we got to meet with multiple church planters and spend time together, seeing the city, multiple people, multiple families. It was their first time in the city. On this trip, we, we actually put together that of five churches that currently exist in the city, one in Gentilly, one in Algiers, one outside the city on the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain in Mandeville, another uptown, um, and then another in the city as well. Between these five churches, they were all planted within about 18 months of each other in 2014 to 2016. None of them ended up in New Orleans East, which is where we desire to go. So New Orleans East, East for uh, all intensive purposes, is still still has an unreached people group, if you will. Uh, churches that are coming with our convictions, with uh, our same doctrine and idea of shepherding, the things that you enjoy here at Grace Bible Church does not exist in New Orleans East with over 90,000 
souls who need to hear the gospel. I want you to notice just one other thing from, from this passage. Everything that happened that we, we've already read about in these first nine verses in Thessalonica, just look again at verse four, because what happened is some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with large numbers of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. That depiction of revival in Thessalonica, all of it happened through faithful evangelists. None of it happened through social efforts, through social programs. None of it happened through legislation. None of it. All of it was through the faithful articulation and proclamation of the gospel. If you had to see wide-scale change in a city, how would you accomplish it? What would you go with? What would you plan? Something other than just being the church? Something other than just preaching the gospel? Something other than evangelism, perhaps? I hope not. Some have said this is insufficient to see cultural change take place. For example, Tim Keller in his book, Center Church, which is a textbook on doing what he calls balanced gospel-centered ministry in the city. He's sort of become the expert on city ministry. He says this in that book, quote, the assumption that society will improve simply by more Christian believers being present is no longer valid. If you care about having an influence on society, evangelism is not enough, end quote. Well, if you just jump down to verse six, the enemies of the church who dragged Jason and his companions before the city authorities, they thought that the evangelism being practiced by Paul and his companions had upset the world and had now arrived in Thessalonica doing the same thing. Evangelism, a just preaching the gospel, quote unquote, just discipling nations to obey all that Jesus had commanded was sufficient, the enemies of the church thought, to upset the entire world. And they were right. It was. It still is. And so this is what we go with, the gospel. Love for people, love for souls, love for Christ, and a clear message that men and women must repent and be reconciled to God. Everything must change for them. New Orleans does not need another social program. What New Orleans needs is not another church seeking to cure homelessness or fix the city's educational system or rid the city of its poverty and crime. Those things can better be accomplished, not through a social program, but through the faithful articulation of the gospel and discipleship of men and women in that city. And so this is what we go with. It's the same thing that Tempe needs. It's the same thing that Phoenix needs and Chandler and Gilbert and Mesa and everywhere else and Papua New Guinea. This is God's ordained means to bring about cultural change. No matter what the cultural gurus tell us that it's insufficient, we can take God's word on the testimony of the scriptures this is how God loves to produce change. This is a requirement for genuine revival. Closely paralleling the faithfulness of the evangelists, a second requirement is that capable teachers must teach. Faithful evangelists must go and capable teachers must teach. Teach. 
Notice in verse 2, Paul made it his custom to go to the Sabbath, to, to go to the synagogue. And for three Sabbaths, Paul was probably in Thessalonica for more than three Sabbaths, if you take his words into account from 1 Thessalonians, but probably not much longer than that. And so God was pleased to use this short time to bring about this massive change. And what Paul did, along with those who accompanied him, is detailed in verses 2 and 3. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. Paul didn't show up in Thessalonica with a canned gospel proclamation, gospel presentation. Hey, I have four points for you. Here's what you need to know, or something like that. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. He was a capable teacher. And so whatever the question was, Paul could go to the scriptures and answer those questions. Whatever needed further elaboration and explanation, Paul could do that from the scriptures. Whatever evidence needed to be presented to the hearer to demonstrate convincing, convincingly for them that Christ was the Messiah, that he had to suffer, that he had to rise again, Paul was capable enough in the scriptures to go there and chapter and verse them. They didn't have chapters and verses, but you get, you get my point. He could quote God's word and say, here is what the Lord says about Christ's suffering. Here is what God said about his Messiah having to rise again. There's a necessary implication to just harp on for a second about knowing your Old Testament. Paul didn't have New Testament revelation to say, hey, let me show you proof that God can become a man and has to die. He had to know his Old Testament, and so do you. I love having uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons come, come knock on the door. I think I've been blacklisted because <laughs> they go to my neighbors and stop coming. But to, to say, hey, can I see your Bible? And their Bible in hand to go to Genesis 18 or other Old Testament passages, Genesis 15, and demonstrate God has taken human form in the past and that those who believe him are justified by faith alone, I'm using your Bible. And so you can go home with it and look up the same verses. You can't escape it. It's in the book that you carry with you. We have to be competent in the scriptures for those kinds of encounters and certainly to go to a new place with perhaps different articulations of the gospel from those people who don't know it, to have to confront them with perhaps different passages than you would people here, that requires a competency in the scriptures. And so for the core team, that means we have to have a high biblical literacy we have to be able to navigate the scriptures, even the Old Testament, especially the Old Testament scriptures. And for people here, it means the same thing. When you encounter error, are you able to navigate God's word in such a way that makes it clear, even if it's not believed, it makes it clear to the listener that Jesus is the Christ. He had to suffer. He had to rise again. For church planting, capable teachers must teach. And just notice again, this was verse 2 from the scriptures. From the scriptures. Paul did not show up in town reasoning with men and women based on their philosophical presuppositions. That's not going to save anybody. Paul didn't appeal for the sake of God's standard to something that the philosophers of the day were already saying. That doesn't save anybody. 
that doesn't make the gospel more palatable to anyone. It just gives them a reason to believe God on wrong motives from their own wisdom. And anyone who thinks they're believing God from their own wisdom is not believing God. They're believing a God of their own understanding. And so Paul reasoned from the scriptures. He gave evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. He was saying this, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, he is the Christ. No more a nameless Messiah to be waited on, but a Messiah who's already come with a name to be believed in. His name is Jesus. Yahweh saves. On this second point, the the capability of the teachers, uh, this was done not only from the scriptures, but this was done amidst much opposition. When opposition came, Paul did not cease teaching. Teaching was not something that they considered a luxury. We do that when we get to it. We do it sometimes when we have space in our schedule. The church didn't think of teaching as something auxiliary to what the church had to be doing. It was primary. It was primary, a primary activity for the church. This is why it continued when the opposition came. Paul even says this in 1 Thessalonians. If you look there, 1 Thessalonians, he notes multiple times how their reception of the word was not before or after, but in the midst of much opposition. Chapter 1, verse 6, he tells the Thessalonians only a month later, he reminds them, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much, op- much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. It was in much tribulation that they were in this practice of receiving the word. In chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, that's Acts 16, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst, amidst much opposition. It was in the midst of much opposition that the gospel was preached to them, and the gospel was received by them. From the scriptures amidst much opposition and the way the gospel, if you just stay in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, capable teachers must teach from a blameless life. This message came to the Thessalonians from the blameless life of its teachers. The blameless life of Paul and his companions who were teaching was characterized by open lives. Their lives were transparent. The believers in Thessalonica who were joining the church had an open door and a clear window into Paul's life. Just look again at chapter two in first Thessalonians verse uh, two or verse one, rather he can tell them, You yourselves know, brethren. You yourselves know this. In verse 2, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel. They know these things because they were close enough to witness them. Jump down to verse 5. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know. Verse 9. For you recall, brethren, that our labor and hardship, or our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we did this, proclaimed to you the gospel of God. They were familiar 
with Paul's work ethic because they were close enough to see him working. Verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. And then again in verse 11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father with his own children. The blameless life of Paul and his companions were so intertwined with the Thessalonian believers that he could say multiple times, you know, you know, you know, you're witnesses. Don't you remember? There's a, an implication there for us. I mean, if, if Paul only saw the Thessalonians during the two-hour window of Sundays, it was probably longer. But if he only saw them for two hours during service on Sunday and for a combined four and a half to six hours a month at small group in Thessalonica, he probably couldn't say you saw all of the things that he just did. There was more life rubbing up against each other than just scheduled, formalized times in the church. They spent time with each other, significant time. They loved to do that. Can you say that of yourself? Do you love to be with the body? Or is it only during obligatory times that you find yourself with other Christians in Grace Bible Church? Are you eager to open your home? Regardless of your resources, come spend time. Let's, let's just spend time together. However we can make that happen, that should be the attitude. These capable teachers not only had... Uh, blameless lives that included open lives. But if we were to read the rest of 1 Thessalonians 2, all of 1 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 to 12, we would see open lives, unmixed motives. We would see that the blameless life was characterized by God's approval and a fear of God. Paul was most mindful of pleasing the Lord in his ministry, not even the people whom he loved, whom he was serving. He cared more about what God thought. And so knowing that God was pleased, that was sufficient. The blameless life of, of these men was characterized by genuine speech, tender care, sacrificial love, tireless service, and constant instruction. To think of the three Sabbaths that Paul or Luke rather recorded in Acts and probably a little bit more time that he wasn't in the synagogue specifically, but building up and training the church before he got run out of town by the persecutors. In that short amount of time, you just read First and Second Thessalonians and you get a glimpse of how much instruction must have happened in that time that he was in the city. This church was clear on the gospel. They knew about Christ's suffering. They knew about Christ's resurrection. And they could articulate it for you so well that he says in chapter one, the word had resounded forth. The word had gone forth from that church. They had so reformed their lives that they had become an example in their living and in their missionary endeavors as a young church to the churches in the surrounding region. So they were clear on the gospel message. They understood missions. They knew well about Christ's coming. And at the end of each chapter in 1 Thessalonians, there is mention made of Christ's coming. And in each of those, Paul is merely telling them of what they already know, except for the exception in 
uh, specifically in some details in chapter four, they don't know what happens to brethren who have died in Christ. But they're well aware that Christ is going to come and rescue them from wrath to follow. They understand, according to chapter 2, verse 13, the nature of God's word, their bibliology. They receive the word, not as the word of man, but as what it really is, the word of God. And so they treated God's word when it came through these evangelists as God's very word. They understood inspiration. How to endure persecution is something else they understood because Paul writes back and commends them. He even says in chapter 3, verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer persecution or affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. They understood that they were destined for persecution and they knew how to handle it. That's even evident from Acts 17. You don't see any retaliation from Jason and the brethren who are being mistreated. They submit to God's hand, even as it has destined persecution for them. And they endure it with much grace. They know how to love one another, according to chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 4. They know how to work, Paul himself being a model for them. They already had received instructions, according to chapter 4, about sexual purity and were obeying those instructions. And they were aware of the day of the Lord, that period of time after Christ rescues his church, that God, Jesus, the Lord, takes vengeance on those who remain on, on earth. They knew that this was coming. They were eager to be rescued from it. And so for us, the implication here is that not only do we have to have capable teachers as a part of church planting, but teaching instruction must be a primary and regular, consistent aspect of body life. Teaching must be that. It must be that here. Teaching. Do you avail yourself to the teaching that is available even here? Do you give it the priority in your life that it should have? Do you prioritize it more than an extra hour of sleep at nine o'clock on Sundays? That would be good. You would benefit if you did. Uh, men, do you prioritize this for your family, for your home? Are you eager to get your rambunctious young children trained to sit under God's word at a young age? Or are you waiting till they're too old to have an appetite for it, but they can sit still to get them sitting quietly? under God's word. Don't wait. Do that now. If you need to practice at home, practice at home. But we're going on Sunday and you need to be able to sit still, sit quietly. That would be good. You would benefit, your family, your household would benefit from such a practice. You can be praying for uh, the New Orleans church plant specifically that another trained man would join this work. I'm currently in, uh, in conversation with a, a number of men within the Expositor Seminary Network, putting this on their radar, uh, testing desire, ministry, like-mindedness. And so I'm in those conversations, but you can pray for that. Uh, if I had my way, Kyle Frazee would come. No pressure. <laughs> we'll, we'll discern what God has for, for the Frazees soon enough. But you can be praying that capable teachers would be eager to join this work. Thirdly, a third requirement for revival 
is that persuaded sinners must join. Persuaded sinners must join. That's no mystery. If you don't have conversions, you don't have revival. This is what happened in Thessalonica back in Acts 17. Luke records verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. Not everybody, not all the Jews who were in the synagogue. That would have been great. Paul has a burden that all Israel would be saved. He, he demonstrates that thoroughly in Acts 9 through 11. That day's coming. But here at this time in this city, only some of them were persuaded. But they were persuaded, praise God, and they weren't persuaded and said, man, thank you so much for preaching the gospel. I'm going to go do my own thing and live like a rogue follower of Jesus. No, they were disciples. And it says, as those who were persuaded, they joined, were joined to Paul and Silas. Some of the Jews were, and along with them, a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, that is non-Jews, and a number of leading women, prominent women in the city, also did this. This is revival taking place. That term joined to just means that they began to be in close association with or to be attached to Paul and Silas. The ones who were establishing the church, laboring to see the church birth, they attached themselves to them and to one another as those who would have been brought into the church. So if God brings about revival in a place, it will not be or it will not result in lots of independent Christians doing however they see fit. It will result in a church being born. People covenanted, attached, together as members, living as Christ has instructed them with one another. Anyone unwilling to closely associate himself with the church cannot also claim close association with Christ. It doesn't happen. Those who closely associate with Christ are eager to join themselves also to Christ's people. This means for us here and in New Orleans, there needs to be meaningful membership. Meaningful membership. When you join yourself to Grace Bible Church, does that really mean something? Do you see yourself as one who is bound to the other members of this church? On membership Sundays, when we have people come up here and the members stand and read the covenant together, do you go, okay, I may not have met those people yet standing up front, but we're members of the same body and everything I'm about to read applies. And so I'm committed to them. When one member suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we rejoice together. And so we're going to labor for each other's good. The one another's in the New Testament, that's for me to practice with those people to whatever degree I can. And you can't practice that to the same degree with everybody. We understand just time doesn't permit. One day we will all live in the same city and have thousands of years to live together with one another. Should we all see the kingdom together? That day's coming. For now, we still have to sleep and work and do normal stuff. So fellowship is inhibited. Those who join themselves to the church consider the meaningfulness of their membership. And we should. We should do that. Finally, one final requirement for revival is fourthly, genuine brothers must endure. Genuine brothers must endure. If it seems that God is working mightily in a place and lots of people are coming to Christ, joining themselves to the church, what does that mean except they endure, unless they endure? If that happens one day, 
and two months from now, people walk away from Christ or things get hard and people are no longer attached to the church? Should we call what happened revival? No. That wasn't a genuine work of God. That was something else. Believers endure, they persevere, and we see that very thing happening in Thessalonica, even to an infant fledgling church. Verse 5 says, In response to the gospel being preached and these large numbers of people, Jews, Greeks, leading women coming, attaching themselves and forming the new church, the Jews were jealous. So sad. Why not just submit? Join them under Christ's better authority. These stubborn, stiff-necked Jews are jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. They attacked the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring out Paul and Silas to the people as the ones leading people out of the synagogue and into the church. So genuine brothers must endure sometimes mobs, sometimes a riotous city, a city that's in an uproar, sometimes home attacks for the sake of the gospel. Verse 6 says, when they couldn't find Paul and Silas, they couldn't find their leaders, they took the next, next best option. They began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city's authorities, saying this, slanderous accusations. These men have upset the world, who have upset the world, have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them. That was actually true. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. That's not true. They were not breaking any laws in what they did. This was mere jealousy, lying against the truth, against God's witnesses. They were not acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, but they were slanderously accused as having done that, even saying that there is another king, Jesus. Well, they were saying there was another king, but not in competition for Caesar's petty throne. So even the church, the brethren, might have to endure just being misunderstood. Can we endure that? Do we have the fortitude here to endure being misunderstood? Will we have the fortitude there to perhaps be misunderstood? When people say, you don't love the city enough because you're just preaching the gospel, can we endure being misunderstood? We need to be prepared for that. Verses seven and, and uh, or verses eight and nine demonstrate that even genuine brothers must endure civil opposition and unjust treatment. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. So now the city authorities are against them. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others who had done nothing wrong, but had to pay to be released from their custody, then they released them. Nothing strange is happening in Thessalonica. This is par for the course. As Grace Bible Church, do we have the ability to send beloved family, cherished friends, precious saints into a potentially dangerous city for the sake of the gospel? Is it worth it to you to send people? Is it worth it to you to go? It must be. God's glory is worth it. And when we one day stand before God, there will not be any amount of resources, time, energy, effort, or sacrifices here at home that we had made that we will regret when we stand before God having made, it will all be worth it. 
to see souls standing around the throne worshiping Jesus from New Orleans, from Papua New Guinea, from other places, knowing that our resources, time, energy, and effort sacrificed to get them there, we will never regret those things. And so we can set our sights on that. We can pray to that end and labor to see these things accomplished. Let's pray. God, thank you so much to know that you love to save sinners. You saved us. You in the midst of our arrogance, in, our, in the midst of our high-handed sin against you, you chose to rescue us from your wrath, from our own folly. And you have even given us the privilege of laboring tirelessly to see the same done in your name for others. Strengthen our church to be a church planting church to continue to be this, even those whom we've already sent out to Gilbert Bible Church. Strengthen them to labor, to be a church planting church and see this work reproduced, replicated from their midst now. And we pray that you would get us to New Orleans soon as soon as it's wise, as soon as it's possible. And that we would see your word flourish amongst an unbelieving city. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.